I'm Matt Bellany, founding partner of Puck News, and I'm covering the inside conversation about money and power in Hollywood. With my new show, The Town, I'm going to take you inside Hollywood with exclusive insight on what people in show business are actually talking about. Multiple times a week, I'll talk to some of the smartest people I know, journalists, insiders, all of whom can break down the hottest topics in entertainment to tell you what's really going on. Listen now. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Read, Write, Own, Building the Next Era of the Internet, a new book from entrepreneur and startup investor Chris Dixon. If you're listening to this podcast, you know what it's like to be part of a community of fans. You value the people who play, perform, and create for everyone. But what if there are more ways to support them, more ways to be a fan? And what if you had even more ways to connect with the teams, artists, and other creators that you love? Even though creators make the internet valuable, how much value do they get for their work, well, that's mostly up to a few big tech companies. Shouldn't creators get more from the platforms they make successful? More value, but also more say, more control, more ownership? Read, Write, Own explores an alternative future for the internet, one that reclaims control for creators, fans, listeners, and gamers, the people who not only use the internet, but make it useful. Read, Write, Own imagines an internet built by us for us. So order your copy of the book today or learn more at readwriteown.com. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, the newest member of the Dutton family, it's Andy Greenwald. Chris, what would they do to me? I mean, I know there's families with black sheeps, but I would not, I don't think I'm a functioning sheep. You know what I uh, mean? I can't wait to talk to you about this because I have to tell you that I've spent most of <laughs> yeah. my time in Philadelphia, which is all of 24 hours, mm-hmm. thinking about the Fleischman is in trouble 1923 <laughs> franchise that you and I could write together where you <laughs> play Toby Fleischman out west. And it's you and James Badge, Dale and Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren. By the way, we're going to be talking about 1923 inflation is in trouble in this episode. And we're also going to be talking about the most anticipated shows of uh, 2023, not 1923. But Andy, like, can you just imagine a guy just rolling through the, the ranch and just being like, what about oh me? My. I mean, also, like in this version, is he like an ovine I, I just want to have an interface with my patients. Yeah. But he's just like a large animal vet, you know? But he's yes. really consumed with social mores. I mean, I, this is really, I need a moment. How like, would I know Toby taken... Fleischman react to a, a swarm of locusts attacking the, the cattle? I mean, well, I do think he likes biblical metaphor. In a mm-hmm. recent episode, he did go to a science ex- exhibition on the darkest black imaginable, right? And went into the void, so to speak. So I think he appreciates a heavy-handed metaphor. So he probably enjoys the television of Taylor Sheridan as a fan. I'm thrown because, you know, I know we planned this podcast and the topics on it, because if there's one thing that I contribute to this podcast, it's advanced planning. But until you said it out loud, I don't think I've realized that this is the starkest red state, blue state divide we've ever done on this podcast. We, now, we honestly do reach across the aisle on this podcast. This, <laughs> this is this this podcast is John Boehner weeping at the unveiling of Nancy Pelosi's portrait last week. Yes, you know what I mean? Yes. Like this really is shocking. <laughs> it's shocking to me. And I I hope that America can I hope it's that the fabric like of it, the nation it, can be stitched together. It's like Charles S. Again. Dutton, like just mm-hmm. like giving that like way to go at the end of Rudy, but instead <laughs> of Charles S. Dutton, it's Carrie Lake and she's like giving it to, to Mark Kelly on his election. You know yeah. what I'm saying? 
Are you recording live from Maricopa County again? Like, I don't think people realize how deep this goes with you. <laughs> it's just a bit that I, I can't tell where the end of it is. Um, so, Andrew. Just, just, just like American democracy. Before I got into uh, the weeds here with these shows, one of which we've been talking about intermittently throughout the season, and yep. the other, uh, a new show from Taylor Sheridan, which is, uh, whether you like it or not, a big deal on TV. He now has like 1,200 of them. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask you, have you gotten any interesting feedback to our episode on Thursday where I feel like, you know, we unintentionally had our hair on fire about the state of streaming TV. But I was curious whether or not anybody from maybe, I guess, in the industry or anyone had listened and hit you up and been like, right on, brother, or it's actually not that deep. Shows get canceled um, all the time. And Henry Cavill didn't have a contract. <laughs> well, first of all, let's hold space for Henry Cavill. Big Hank. Hammer and Hank. Big bank the, Hank, more like the real, the real Hammer and Hank. No, I heard he didn't have a deal. I heard it was just like yada yada. No, he. You mean to be Superman? Yeah, I heard. No, he had, no, it was but, like it was like, yo, we're gonna do this for sure. Go ahead and and post that to the gram. Yeah, no, that was like when I was gonna do rewatchables last month, right? It was just like <laughs> I announced to my Twitter. I'm back on Twitter to let everyone know. Um, no, I, I, I first of all, I just want to be like. That guy just stays shifting franchises. You know what I mean? Like he just oh, yeah, he's, he's like, don't Warhammer worry. Now. I'll do the one based on tiny action figures of orcs, because that's where my heart has always lived. The fact that one of the takeaways from the DC story, which we're not doing again, I promise, but one of the takeaways seems to be that we're all pawns in Dwayne Johnson's great game. Yeah. Is wild to me. Well, he tried to have like he tried to do a coup. He tried to stop yeah. the steal over at DC and just be like, Black Adam is now the center of the DCU. I got I got Big Bank Hank in the end of this movie, and uh, we're going to go forward with Black Adam versus Superman. I don't want to be facile here, but The Rock and Roger Stone, you know, there, there's, some, there's some overlap there, <laughs> right? I'm just saying. But to your point about the industry, I would actually say that the relative... I mean, this wasn't Charles S. Dutton nodding his head, but... What I seem to get from people that I speak to was just nodding. Like, yeah, that's that's what's going it's on tough. here. Now, right. I do think it's always important to say this, and I think sometimes we do and sometimes we forget to. A lot of this is inside the clubhouse stuff right now. This is not affecting the on-field product, so to speak, yet. Right. Um, and hopefully it won't. You well, know, we'll I, talk I, about it, that when we get to our 2023 anticipated okay. shows. But I but, went through uh, the list. I went through, I did my deep, deep dive research here to put together this list for us. And I have to say, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next year. You know what I mean? Maybe this is one of those things where the ripple effect will be felt until 24. It's, I think that's very possible. But I also, I, I do think you're asking the right question, which is to say that when we get stuff wrong, well, let, let me rephrase that. <laughs> if we ever got anything wrong, which, you know, come on. Um, our industry ombuds people often flag it for us, or at least give us context. And it's true. Uh, no, nothing, nothing. Now, as I've noticed, as I've noted, I, I'm no longer on social media. I've also disabled my email, and I won't let you text me anymore. So, all of that may be affecting things. You're on, but yesterday was Sunday, so I figured you were on Twitter all day because it was an Eagles day. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't a good um, Eagles day, so I didn't. But thank you for checking in. <laughs> all right, Andy, I have uh, intermittently over the course of the last couple of years asked you to come out to the ranch with me. It's and really check true. Out <laughs> what Taylor's got cooking over the. Uh, the open fire, what he's grilling up. Uh, I think we did, you did all of one episode of Mayor of Kingstown? Uh, I did. I'm still not okay, but go on. You didn't get to the episode where Jeremy Renner conducts basically a uh, vigilante killing of a guy who blew up a child in a meth explosion, right? No, I don't remember it. Can I, can I, <laughs> I don't want to interrupt your bit, but like when you map out your week, CR's <laughs> week of media, you know, maybe you have to watch something for rewatchables, you like to watch some sporting events, like, do you savor the Sheridan jewels? Or are you like, this, oh, yeah. I'm in the mood. I don't mean like, do you enjoy it? But I mean, with, with mayor of, of Kingstown, are you like, I've got a nice hour carved out to watch Jeremy Renner vigilante shit? Like, you're in the right headspace for it. The problem with it, the, the problem with that show, and there's a few shows like it every year, is that um, I'm alone. Like, no one wants to watch it with me. 
No one really wants to talk about it with me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Buddy. Everybody thinks it's weird that I'm so into it, especially yeah. Mayor of Kingstown. I think people were like, are you okay? Do you want to talk to a Freudian therapist or something? And I, I got to say, so for my guy, Taylor, who yeah. I obviously have, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a bit, but it's mostly like just, I would say 82%, like pure admiration for his project, for his prolific output. And honestly, for his style of dialogue, his commitment to a kind of like kind of bare knuckled noir, uh, tough guy storytelling that I have a soft spot for. It, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm on board. But over the course of the last season of Yellowstone, so the one that aired and then the one that's currently airing, I would say Tulsa King. Yep. And, and now 1923, I think my guy might need to take, take a playoff. Like, I think, I think that yeah. this is now, we were just talking about like, oh, are we going to start seeing the downstream effects of the boardroom convulsions hitting actual television screens? I think that we're kind of seeing the effects of Taylor Sheridan maybe just having too much on his plate. There was something really breathtaking about Yellowstone season one. I would even say, personally, for me, 1873, the sort of previous installment of the Dutton saga, and Mayor of Kingstown season one, where I was like, this guy is just like a pretty unique voice in TV, and there are elements of this that feel like a CBS procedural, but there are also elements of it that feel like Sicario. You know, like I, yeah. I was, I was really fired up about it. Um, 1923, I like I, everything about it is is like ready made for me to love. It's set during uh, Prohibition or right during the the sort of lead up to Prohibition, I guess. Although everything in Montana seems to be a little bit tweaked in terms of its relationship to the rest of the nation. Uh, post-war story. It stars Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren as Duttons. Um, James Badgedale specifically is the child of Tim McGraw and Faith Hill's characters on 1873. And it's about this sort of transition from the Old West into modernity and into a more industrialized society. But it's also about the minutia of like where sheep's graze versus where cattle graze. And, and it's like got all this stuff that I would ordinarily like. Uh, and in any other moment, I just feel like Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren being on a television show would just be like, absolutely, like, stop what you're doing and check this out news. But there's something about this show that feels like a little under undercooked for me. I'm going to stick with it. But mm -hmm. between the, it's yet another Taylor Sheridan show that has a show inside a show. So we can get to that. But there is an entire plot in Nairobi uh, with a, a character who I imagine is going to come back to Montana at some point and is kind of like the Casey Dutton character on, on Yellowstone. And then it seems a little caught in this nether region between TV and film, uh, visually and also in terms of its pacing that I, I, I haven't quite figured it out. It's only been one episode. Uh, I'm definitely going to give it a chance, but I was curious what you thought because I know that you are already skeptical going into the project. First of all, we got to stop with the, the year titles. Like we just got to, we got to, we got to so stop with this. I, as well, we were trying to plan this, I kept saying like, well, there's 1923 and you kept thinking I was referring to 1899. Yeah, I was like, I'm, I'm getting there. I, I still think they're on a boat, though, but I'm getting there. I promise I'm going to get to it. What was the other one? What, what was the one that with Sam Elliott and Tim McGraw? 18 what? Andy, late breaking news. I've been informed by the Taylor Sheridan ombudsman that it's actually 1883, not 1873. But you, I would be, I'm, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiving myself. I'm showing myself grace. Yeah. By saying there's a lot of shows with years as the, <laughs> as the title. I don't think you can be forgiven. I think you must go on a solo odyssey into the African savanna and hunt the game <laughs> until you look into the mouth of danger and understand what you've done. Um, which, by the way, might be how you're spending Christmas. We haven't actually discussed your holiday plans. So I, I, what I wanted, I want to begin my takeaway again, one episode of this with 1883, which I do think I was not fully fair to because I didn't really understand it. And I did watch more than one episode of that show eventually, but you just touched on it and what you were saying. It is a very unusual mix mm -hmm. of the most traditional and staid CBS television show making with a type of cinematic language that Taylor Sheridan is very good at and that I think I'm much more responsive to when I understand the delivery system better. And the thing about 1883 that I didn't understand is that it's still him and it didn't give a fuck, right? Like it was dark. Mm -hmm. And I misunderstood it because of the cbs -E aspects of it, that it was just sort of patting itself on the back for being, you know, a nice family that did good. You know, that wasn't what that show was. And 
even if I didn't enjoy it, I really respected it. Uh, <laughs> did you think that that was what the Dutton family yeah. crest said? Yeah, we nice did, family, nice family does, good. does good. Yeah, right? but it's in Latin, so I didn't read it, um, you know, immediately. This show did make me be like, can we do a wellness check to the ranch? Like, can we just run a couple people over there just make sure everybody's doing okay? Yeah, because the the sadistic nuns and priests beating each other oh, yeah. for That's like right. one minute and then it's like wow oof. and then they go to another room to beat on each other some more it's like oh wow I, you know i get it and, and then, then it's they like take then they baths. Keep, yeah then they keep beating on each other and i'm like okay well you know it's good that this stuff gets worked through but i don't necessarily want to be in the 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 crisis suite when we're doing it um but beyond that what struck me and it's strange was that it just felt very pro forma. And some of that I do think comes from Harrison Ford, which, you know, who one of the great movie stars of our time, but does give off a very, very, very distinct vibe of what the fuck am I doing here and why am I doing this here? And that's it's, partly the character, but he's, you know... It's tough when you compare it to Sam Elliott's performance in 1883, though, which I thought was quite sure. beautiful and quite powerful and quite lived in and, and emotionally... I wonder, I, I really don't mean this in any other, Just I, I'm just saying this to say it. Yeah. I wonder if Harrison Ford's like four years too late for this role. I mean, he's, he's an 80-year-old man, and so he can make whatever choices he wants. I mean, he could even be elected president, from what I understand. It's fine. Age is nothing but a number these days. But I, I do have a thing with him, and I never want to impugn a legend whose work I love and means an enormous amount to me. But if you notice that, like, just he's one of those actors who seems to be less and less interested on being in being in on the joke the older he gets and his to me his greatest performances of course, I mean to me I'm like I'm like I'm unique in being like Han Solo and Indiana Jones are cool uh what makes those characters great is the smirk right like yeah they don't want to be there but they're smirking and they're there and they're heroic despite themselves and when he takes more serious roles he sometimes just zags very much in the other direction that's an actorly choice many actors do it but it was a little bit tough to swallow especially when you compare him with his co-star here who i think helen mirren who i think expressly was like i really want to shoot people in the face with a shotgun and do a banshee scream to the heavens yeah. like she seems to understand the potential of what she's in and be thrilled about it in a different different way and i guess my my main takeaway from this episode which you know, I, I, I'm not a big grazing rights guy. Never have right. been. Very right. honest about that. You know, I, I, I used to you, learn you a lot more about... You're still yeah. doing a lot of research when it comes down to sheep versus cattle and who... It's also that to. I used to... I feel like I knew more about land leases back when I was on Twitter, you know, but I've just sort of given that up. You know, I don't really follow those accounts anymore. But her show is the one that I would like to watch. And she seems to thus far to be the only one who's really in that show. And I... But again, I feel strange. And I, I'm, I'm very interested to hear that you were a little bit re reserved about your feelings too. Because you know what it was? It, I can't it, tell if it's a feature or a bug with this guy. There was shows, something really like when, when, when Yellowstone premiered and when, Ye when Yellowstone was really cranking in the first two seasons, there was something that felt huge about it. Not only in terms of its scope, like cinematically, but in terms of, you know, the kind of mythical Steinbeckian vibe of that family. Yeah. And to me, Getting so into the minutia of grazing rights, even though I know in the Yellowstone pilot, they're like, it's a, all everything that happens is about a group of stolen horses that they're there or cattle that they're arguing about whether or not it belongs to one party or another. Like, I understand that this has always been the sort of bread and butter of Yellowstone, but it almost felt like we were getting jumped into the third episode here. Mm -hmm. Like, there wasn't a lot of like setup. And I think possibly that's because now Sheridan with this saga has developed like a shorthand, like, the patriarch is going to be gruff, but always has like a, a like a heart of gold. The matriarch is going to be the thing that really holds things together. There's going to be one son who's the sort of prodigal outcast and another who's not ready for prime time. You know, there's just and then there's going to be this group of people on the periphery who are the antagonists like Bronn from Game of Thrones or whatever that are going to be kind of... Who I was very happy to see, by the way, Jerome. The Blaine. amount of accent stuff going on in this are, is dynamite. You know, just the amount of Scottish and Irish accents being thrown are really, really good. Not since Gangs of New York have I been this overwhelmed. Uh, I, I also want to say uh, the great Brian Garrity's on this show. He is. My favorite cowboy. A guy named Zane. He's, Not to put you know, too he, fine a point on it. 
he's smiling too, though, you know, and he's happy to be there. I love seeing him and and makes me want to watch more. Can you, um, are you you're, so you're legally allowed to be on Big Sky and 1923? Well, if they're set in, if they're in different decades. Yeah. The Big Sky prequel series, I don't think you could be a part of. Right. Um, that's 1870, 72, I believe, as you, as you said. It's interesting. I think it's just worth noting that one, it, this has come up a lot in different contexts. And I feel like it's important to shine a light on it and be like, this might not speak for people or the industry at large. But when I hear that there are going to be more explorations of the blank universe or prequels, what excites me about that is, oh, okay, well, then maybe one of these stories is going to be a, you know, John Huston set in Africa story and the other is going to be a noir yeah. and the other is going to be a war movie and we're going to do genre to genre stuff and just use the the larger story to sort of Trojan horse in different types of shows which is the Andor corollary right like yeah. that's one of the reasons why we love Andor and we were asking for that in Star Wars for over a decade we got it we loved it our show of the year that doesn't necessarily track with the bottom lines of large multinational corporations or potentially the fandom of a show right and, and also it's worth noting the particular need that these Yellowstone prequels are filling, which is, I take nothing away from Taylor Sheridan's creative enterprise when I say, Paramount fucked up and sold the rights to Yellowstone to Peacock. They can't show their flagship show on their streaming service. So they were like, Taylor, here's a blank check. Give us more of that. Yeah. So we can have that. And that is what they're getting. So if he, even if he was like, I want to do this entire season like the African Queen, that's not what it's going to be. Right. The, I mean, right now he's in a zone. So I'm going to spoil a couple of Taylor Sheridan universe things for people. Even okay, though I've, 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 ar- I've already mentioned the the uh, meth meth dealing vigilante action in Mayor of Kingstown. So yes. did you know that until the finale of 1883, I, along with millions of others, was under the impression that it was an ongoing series? I, I was under the same impression. And um, spoiler, it's then not. Sam, Sam Elliott gets to the coast of Oregon and takes his own life and the narrator of the show passes away and as we are introduced let it be known very early in 1923 that Tim McGraw's character dies and that then Faith Hill's character dies in a snowdrift yeah so that was a real (laughs) just (laughs) buried that show (laughs) that seems vindictive we are not getting 1885 but did you also know like I think I've mentioned this on Yellowstone last season I would say cumulatively three episodes of the season was spent with a tertiary character yeah. working on a different ranch in Texas. I, is a potential spinoff, right? Like, is it? Yeah, spin, but it's like, like a backdoor. You, you're like, oh, we need Taylor. We need you to do this. I can't tell if this is like the rehearsal, and he's just like, I've, I've like, I'm basically doing cowboy John Dealman out in the West, where, where we're just going to show life. Or if he's if he's like I actually don't have any more story, so I need Jimmy to go to the Four Sixes Ranch for three episodes to learn what it means to be a man. My, my sense of this, and and I say this with oh, after this nearly is, being paralyzed while being a rodeo. Uh, <laughs> this is I say this with real respect. This whole enterprise, and I'm barely barely cognizant of it, as you've alluded to correctly, but it does remind me of this of the episode of Atlanta this season when Van wanders, you know, brings Lottie to the sound stages of a <laughs> yeah. Tyler Perry type mogul and it's just like Willy Wonka with Willy Wonka's TV factory where it just a guy is just writing on a typewriter piano and casting people that he sees in his security monitors and changing everything i mean it's this is what it looks like when one auteur is fully empowered and that makes it interesting yeah. no matter what um but I do think that leads to, that does lend to this feeling that I get from the stuff, which is like I, the, the ground feels like it's shifting underneath me. I don't get it. And similarly, why you to, to your point, Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren on a TV show is insane. Helen Mirren and Harrison Ford in a Western for Paramount Plus dropping a week before Christmas is a lunacy. But they are not this show. They are folded in. Yeah, they're to in a Taylor Sumble. Sheridan project the larger project. And I guess that's the, that brings me full circle to say like, it really does feel, and feel is a really lousy word to use in this type of analysis, if that's what it is. And that's off of one episode because that's all that was made available and now that's all that's aired. But it really does feel like Helen Mirren was like, awesome. 
that'll be a really fun way to spend six weeks. I love it. Yeah. And, I, you know, Harrison Ford, we'll see, but he's never been like famously an ensemble player. I mean, remember the one time, remember like Steven Soderbergh was like, I've just won Oscars. Please come be in traffic because you are a god. And he was like, I, I don't do things where I'm not the star. Yeah, but now he's like kind of doing the the victory lap of his career in a lot of ways. I mean, he kind of got through that, right? So he did yes, he got Star through. Wars, he did Blade Runner, and now he's doing Indiana Jones. But now he's like, I'm just on TV. Like he's Alan Arkin. He's so he's in this he's in this show, and he's on the upcoming Jason Siegel show on Apple that's TV so called weird. Shrinked. It's just that's Harrison Ford. He, it is him now. Yeah. Also, he you know he's one of those actors. Do you remember? I mean, this was a thing. Maybe it's coming back into fashion thanks to Taylor Sheridan. But I remember. Being a kid, my mom would get People magazine and there would always be articles about movie stars and the movie stars then were Bruce Willis and Harrison Ford. And Bruce Willis was like, I, I bought a town in Montana and live here now. And Harrison Ford lives in Wyoming. Yeah. But it just just flies his private plane, Southern California, and <laughs> most of the time lands it here as well. But like people who love this shit want to do it as their job. So I, you know, it's like Tommy Lee Jones being in Lonesome Dove, making fun of everyone else for not, wear, not knowing how to ride oh, horses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I feel like this wasn't the hardest sell for Harrison because first of all, he's probably getting a million dollars an episode. And second of all, he gets to ride horses and be not too far from where he actually wants to be. So I, I, I don't mean to mind read that he doesn't want to be there, but his, his, his performance so far is pretty crusty. I know where you want to be. Tell me. The Upper East Side of Manhattan. <laughs> Look, I just feel a, really... Just, just a bunch a, of Jews trying to work it out, man. <laughs> We're just trying to figure it out. Now... Was this episode of the podcast delayed because I'm on major latka duty today and was a little late boiling the potatoes? No, no pun intended. Yes, but I feel a little, I feel a little vulnerable here as we pivot. Do you feel seen by Fleischman is in trouble? <laughs> At times, and then sometimes I feel targeted. Yeah, like I feel, I feel a little uncomfortable. You're like the only person who's good here is Josh Radner. <laughs> Josh Radner is he's a, he's a lawyer and he's solid. So we're um, going to talk about Fleischman is in trouble through episode six, which is what is currently up on the Hulu network. And that's six through six of eight, right? Eight that's total? correct. Okay. Yeah. And so right. spoilers going forward as we end episode six, just to give you a sense of where we're at. Um, this is a very, I would say Libby heavy, but there's a lot it's of Libby centric. A yeah. lot of, a lot of Lizzie Kaplan. Um, and it ends with her character, Libby Slater finding Claire Danes' character, Rachel Fleischman, sitting on a park bench in Manhattan. The, she has been missing. There have been some clues as to what she's been up to. There's been some hints of what she's been up to. People have seen her in parks resting, but nobody knows where she is. And while this is all happening, Toby has been kind of going on this summer of self-discovery. He's been going on dates. He's been reconnecting with his college friends. He's been trying to single parent. And we kind of are now getting a little bit more of a fleshed out view of, I guess his world, but also more his friends and the way his friends see him. Yes. Um, so the last two episodes, one's called Vanta black. And then what's the sixth one called? Uh, it's something about enjoying ourselves or this is how I, this is how I do enjoyment. Uh, this is how I do enjoyment. I, That's a great title. I think title it's called 1870, <laughs> 1875. <laughs> I don't know if we made enough out of the Dutton or Africa plot, but let's let's keep going. Well, <laughs> and, that, and that dude talking about hunt, hunting leopards and once it gets a taste of man, man is all he wants. <laughs> Do you think that's act? This is my enjoyment was the name of the episode. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know what. See, I wish yeah. I had like a film of you sitting at a coffee shop in Silver Lake being like exterior hunter <laughs> turns to his assistant and says you joke but this is if i were to write a scene of big game hunting on the veldt like that it would begin the way this episode began with yeah. all of my deep knowledge of the mighty cats like <laughs> i just want to make eye contact and then shoot it in the face and then it dies on top of you <laughs> it's pretty good it's pretty good i mean Again, like I could be like, I don't know if I. I'm sorry, we're still talking about the other show. <laughs> that tells you something. I just did a whole fucking. And then you spoiled the thing, but it is kind of wild for me to sit here in my ivory tower, mm -hmm. the Upper East Side of Echo Park, and be like, um, "Your yeah, blue check shaped couch." Yeah, <laughs> here are the problems with this show, and yet it begins with Helen Mirren shooting a guy in the face, and then immediately followed by another guy shooting a lion in the heart. <laughs> and the lion dies on him. If you described this to me, I would be like, thank you. And then I'd be like, quick follow up. I said, no mushroom tea, please. But I appreciate your generosity. So, okay, there's something to be said for it. This is my enjoyment. 
This is what we're talking about? Okay. Fleischman. Let's go. Do you, I, I, Chris, so I set, go. set up the show. <laughs> and what do you what do you think of uh what do you think of the, as a show kind of because one of the criticisms of the show had been does it need yeah. to be this long uh, as yes. not a I did not read this book um, I am enjoying the show very much it doesn't feel too long to me um, I also don't feel like they're overdoing it with the the mystery of the show I like that there is basically like this suggestion that Rachel is just doing a very good job avoiding Toby but is around you know that people mm-hmm. have seen her um, and I found the end of that episode episode six, which yep. essentially details like Libby's like own crisis. So for most of the first five episodes were like largely like in the world of like Toby and the way he's viewing his world. And Libby herself is also having this like, I used to be a person. Now I'm a member of a family. Now I feel mm-hmm. like I'm just like this organ for this other body to, to feed off of. And that she's kind of having this like weird, very New York night where she has a fight with her partner. She's like, why don't you just go home without me? And then she stays out all night and stays out all the next day and finds herself in this park smoking a cigarette, which reminds her of her former life, like when she was yeah. a young person smoking cigarettes, as cigarettes do. do you, did you like the the kind of expansion of the the sort of POV? I did. I really appreciated it. I think Lizzie Kaplan's great in the part, and I really appreciated the, the, the time and generosity and thoughtfulness given to the character. And I thought it was also pretty interesting not to presume anything about Taffy, who wrote the book and adapted the series. We don't know. I don't, I don't know her personally. I, I, don't, I don't know if you do, but we, we traveled in the same we, we, media circles. We've been on safari once or twice, but I, 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 yeah. I could say. <laughs> but that was back when the great lions were still roaming. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's right. The literary lions. Um but I, I did appreciate this episode. Uh, I watched five and six together, and I believe it's in five, and maybe it's early in six, when Libby was basically like, to be a woman writing in a magazine, like nobody cares or notices what I do other than the fact that I turn my copy in on time unless I'm writing about a man. And then, it's hard, and then she's going to write a novel. And it's hard not to think of Taffy, a, a woman journalist in New York, writing a novel about Dr. Toby Fleischman, and then maybe burying the lead or Trojan horsing the Libby story in a way that, and and maybe ultimately the Rachel story as well. I don't know where this goes in a way that will feel more full and fair. And I look forward to that. I also want to couch this by saying, I can't imagine a better adaptation, again, of a book I haven't read. But the reason I say that is because, but here's why I say it. Two things are hard to do in screen, on screen that I think are easier to do in print. Again, Mm -hmm. I don't know the book. I don't presume to know how it's constructed. But if it is in some way similar, those two things that I'd I'd like to highlight are the stretching of an an inevitable mystery, which in this case is Toby isn't really wondering why his wife has completely vanished from society and abandoned their children. These two episodes are the ones where I was like, this is enough now. Like, this Mm. is just, this feels so they did a good job of foregrounding the anxiety when he's like, something's wrong with her, but then something's, you know, but then he needed to focus on other things and that was just his mind spiraling. But at a certain point you'd have to, you do, I joked about this with Taylor Sheridan, like some kind of wellness check would probably be in order. And these were the episodes where I was like, okay, we got to get moving on this. Right. But they've hidden that so well that that is a fleeting feeling. You know, I think that's done very well. The second thing is um, sympathetic or non-sympathetic narrators. Um, I don't really know how Toby is presented in the book, but one thing that happens on screen is when someone is your main character, audiences are preconditioned to like him or her or to root for him or her. And then sometimes that gets chipped away early. Sometimes it gets chipped away late and it can be done very effectively. But I do think it's a different relationship than we have with books um, where we're not seeing their face. We're not seeing the, the actor giving it their all or whatever. And so we might have a little more skepticism early because one of the things these two episodes did that I appreciated is that Toby's a little myopic. He's a little self-involved and can yeah. be incredibly, uh, he can be a dick, you know, and he can be inappropriate. He can screw up. I mean, we all can. I don't mean to suggest that he's unique in that. But so much of this, so much of this, of the early episodes were feeling some imp- sympathy, if not empathy for him and the circumstances he finds himself in. So that when he pulls the, it's Dr. Fleischman to the camp director, yeah. you're like, this is an empowering moment. He is being a man in the world and, or an adult in the world and taking care of his business. When he does it to his resident, it feels weird and petty and completely about him. You know, and, and, and similarly, like, there's a really touching moment with the woman who's married to n- not Tucker Carlson, uh, yeah. who won't leave her apartment. 
where she does a nice thing for him. She gives him like a sort of a, I guess, an a alphanumer- alphanumeric related massage. And he's like, no one had ever just been purely nice to him and that matters. And then when he goes to her house and is not accepting of her circumstances and is just kind of shitty about it. And he's like, like wearing like, shorts. Yeah, and I'm like, he's just, <laughs> he's kind of a dick. Yeah. Now, that's, these are all good things. But I guess I was really- The premise of that woman is like, she won't go be seen in public with him. And he keeps yeah. being like, why won't you be seen in public like, while he's wearing like charcoal gray Banana Republic shorts and black sneakers? And I'm his, like, maybe- His dog is just wantonly shitting just on everything. Put on a pair of fucking jeans, my guy. <laughs> like, I mean, also like, it, how, like one to t- like, we're not, we're not the target audience for this, Chris, but like one to 10, how much of a catch is Dr. Toby Fleischman in summer You gotta tell me, man. I don't know. I don't know. He's, I, he's he's getting after it this summer. I like how this show feels like a fevered summer. Yeah. I, I, I like it captures, uh, maybe not since Do the Right Thing, summer in New York. Wow. <laughs> I'm just trying I to mean, get your attention. <laughs> that was that was that was my comp as well. So yeah. I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I did just to just to finish the thought. I was like I was just admiring the way this adaptation has handled those two things, while noting that these two episodes, I they weren't as pleasurable for me as the previous ones were. And again, that's okay. I think the show Fleischman should get into trouble. I mean, it's right there in the title. Um, but some of the stuff felt a little bit like, it's just like, it wasn't reading the room of the show. Like the the kids bursting into a touching impromptu duet, uh, duetting uh, the Hillary Clinton uh, campaign song, fight song in the backseat. That's right. It's like, I was like, I don't get that this is being played straight. This isn't tracking with my experience of the show. That's okay. Not too long after that, there's the Adam Brody and his girlfriend make pasta scene, which is beautiful because I think my goal in life is to have Adam Brody make me pasta now because I I am, he's not in trouble in my book. I would watch him on any show forever. He's fantastic. But just that like the show can hit these moments with, it's almost, I can almost take it for granted the the types of emotional scenes that the show does really well. Which are which it make they, it makes it look easy when so many other shows don't even try. Um, I have a problem with the depiction of travel on this show. Thank you. This is I was hoping we could get here. I this was has worried been, the show has gotten too soft, but thankfully Sam woke something up in us. I think. Well, he yelled at us about like, oh, you guys want to watch people travel, like how how see how long it takes from get to planet to planet or for to get across a, the Game of Thrones land on Dragonback or whatever. And it's like, I, I fair point. That's well taken, but. As somebody who lived in New York City for 10 years, maybe not the years specifically related where the show is set, but Mm -hmm. right before then, I don't think the show is doing enough work to show just what a grueling fucking Mm -hmm. death march it is to get anywhere in New York City, much less to New Jersey. Yes. It's the New Jersey part. Now... I did live in New York City until this summer. This is the summer I left. This summer got me out. 2016. (laughs) And one of the beauties of living in New York is you, you know, 24 hour subway, you can get wherever you need to go, even even if everything smells like dumpsters full of, you know, overheated, exploded rat carcasses. <laughs> it's fine. Um, but there are some things that cannot be done. And one of those things that cannot be done is if a friend has moved to Jersey City or Montclair or a place like that, what cannot be done is you cannot see that friend anymore. No. I'm very sorry. You cannot. Maybe and on a weekend. you can't be like, I'm just going to run over to New Jersey for the day. No. Exa- or vice versa. The, the, the single least believable thing about the show, which is heartbreaking, because I do think Lizzie Kaplan's arc is moving and, you know, not necessarily relatable to our experience, but broadly accurate of magazines as I remembered them and worked in them. But she's not coming to hang out in Madison Square Park on a weekday from Jersey. She's just not doing it. Yeah. She's not doing it. That is, that is absolutely insane. It has the same energy as people. So when, like when I would come to LA as a, as a visitor mm-hmm. in a magazine run by people who said that that prose was killing it and, got, and murdered it or whatever they do on this show, they'd put me up in West Hollywood because that's where the hotels were. And I, a friend would be like, <laughs> I live in Silver Lake. Would you like to come over? And I would be like, yes, I would. And I would get in a rental car and, I would, and someone would offer me a printed MapQuest directions. <laughs> and I'd say, no, thank you, good man. Sunset Boulevard runs from where the sun sets to where it rises. And I would just drive on it. It probably took 50 minutes. Yeah. And I'd be like, great, no problem. I don't live here. It took eight days of living here before Los Feliz <laughs> felt a little far west. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so just imagine if there was a river 
Yeah, that, and a that tunnel. part is implausible. A tunnel yeah. where oh. nothing ever worked and it was crumbling just, and nobody drove forward. I just had a shiver. Of, <laughs> I mean, my God. So, what is? Where are you with all of this? With this, I mean, because I think there's a version of the show that we also both were enjoying, which is like. 40-year-old people with 40-year-old people I, I, problems I don't, is an I don't, enjoyable honestly, hang. I don't think I can assess this show properly. It's not that it cuts too close to home in that my life reflects this, but like right. the the issues of this show are so familiar to me in my personal life in terms yeah. of things my friends are experiencing or have experienced. And just even the anxiety about where to move and where to live and where to raise mm-hmm. kids and I want a yard versus I want the juice of the city or whatever. It's like... It's really weird. It's just kind of like, I find it in, in that sense, incredibly entertaining. <laughs> you know, like, I, I would say, Chris, as someone who is your friend um, and watches you as you consider a lot of things about like where to move and, you know, and also that you take, you do take some emotional uh, uh, information from the TV you watched. I worry about the references to 1873, 1883, <laughs> because they also were interested in Oregon and... Yes. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I just feel like that's that's not a good. Model I can't. For you. I can't do do the same business Sam Elliott did in Oregon. That's um, fair. Okay, so we're going to keep talking about Fleischman. This will be our last new show of the year. Uh, so we'll, we're going to do a mailbag the episode that goes up, um, I believe, next Thursday. So we won't get a chance to chat about Fleischman until it's probably concluded. But I, I look forward to talking to you about the end of this of this series. Um, yeah, I'm really. I, I just to, just to put a button on it, like. It's it's time now for Claire Danes to come back in the show. Yeah. Like this is this is time, and I would really like to know about it because I did think that the although it would be screen... really funny if Harrison Ford style, she was like, <laughs> "That's great, guys. Thanks for the great three Jesus. days." <laughs> I, I, I'll say that not since um, a, a film scene I reference a lot is is the split screen uh, meal in Annie Hall where Annie Hall's family is eating and talking about the swap meet and just drinking straight gin, and then it split screens to Alvy's family underneath the cyclone screaming at each other. And I was like, ah, well, this is, this is, this is an interesting observation on different religious uh, 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 behaviors. Um, not since that have I seen such a, such a broadly drawn uh, split screen of a party as we saw in this episode. Yes. You know, where like all the people who went to summer camp in Israel are just like, Everything Toby Fleischman says is incredible. Let's just keep <laughs> pouring like Trader Joe's Syrah down his gullet to get some more of these. Whereas joke like jewels. Sam Rothberg is like, you piece of shit. Why don't you want these Rangers tickets? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to Gestad, you dipshits. And he's just like, I'm telling jokes. It's like, never want to say that. Never want to say that at a party. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, File a claim right on the State Farm mobile app and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. This episode is brought to you by the new true crime docuseries, American Nightmare, only on Netflix. In 2015, the Vallejo, California Police Department received a strange phone call about a kidnapping. But when the truth is stranger than fiction, you won't know who to trust or what is real. A fast-paced true crime thriller with cliffhangers at every turn. Watch American Nightmare now, only on Netflix. It's hard not to add a side of hot, crispy hash browns to your favorite McDonald's breakfast. It's even harder not to eat said hash browns before you get home. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Okay, Andy, we have a lot of customs on this show. Mm. One of them is having Sam on for the year end pod. Yep. Another one that is not always one that you participate in. 
is our oh. next year's most anticipated oh, shows. Is that because you the, the tradition like no other is you running through this solo from your mom's house? So I'm- one year, if I remember correctly, I, I think this. this is two years ago, three years ago. It was pre-pandemic. Yeah. Kaya was like, yeesh, we have an ad, so we need a show. And I was like, no prob. Just got done three beers watching Sixers. Let That's me true. read through this other website's <laughs> list of shows and just be like, this sounds great. And Half that was- of which were like BBC shows. I don't know where I, I think the website was like a, like a, maybe an English language Swedish page. So I was just like reading off like, ah, the, the, and I think I'll, there were some really, there were some bangers on my list, but that started a tradition that I want to keep going here. But I'm going to include you in it. What's incredible is I think you did that. And then two months later, Spotify was like, we're all in. We want it. We want yeah. the whole package. CR is part of it. Give us the um, website. So what I got here is I've broken down 2023s. I've pulled this from several sites, but the one that I, I thought I would shout out because I find it to be a, a an awesome website and B very useful for stuff like this is the playlist.net, who also did some incredible and or coverage if you're looking for additional podcasts or writing about that show. Uh, but they put together a list of like 70 shows that they the most anticipated shows for next year. As with everything, these things may or may not come out. As with everything, it could get bumped, it could get lost in the you know the waves of of streaming tv deals where it gets moved to different services or something like that but for the most part i think this is a pretty solid list and i've broken it up into different categories andy okay and what i'm going to do is just ask you for your kind of like um a vibe check like your enthusiasm for for various things here so the first thing which we often don't talk about when it comes to anticipated shows is the returning shows. And this year coming mm-hmm. up in 2023, we've got a few of them. Here are some returning champions coming back into our lives. Succession, Severance, yeah. Barry, Fargo Season 5 with John Hamm. They did and, it again. And others. And others, yeah. But Good I was just... Cast. Season 3 of Reservation Dogs, Season 3 of Ted Lasso, Season 3 of The Mandalorian, Season 2 of Loki, and then the two featured presentations, Andy. Oh, all right. Justified colon City Primeval on FX and True Detective Night Country on the home box office. Really and uh, I, I'm going to need a bib when these things come. <laughs> so for just like a little bit of behind the scenes stuff or backstory here. So Justified is coming back as a mini series on FX and it is adapting one of me and Andy's favorite Elmore Leonard books, one of his Detroit books called City Primeval High Noon in Detroit. Uh, it is not a Raylan book, but it is very easy to imagine Raylan taking over the the cop character in it. And it does what it says on the package. It is High Noon in Detroit. It's about a cop versus a psycho killer named the Oklahoma Kid. And the Oklahoma Kid in the miniseries is going to be played by Boyd Holbrook. It's so perfect. I love Justified. I think Justified would lend itself very well to the Sherlock style. Let's just bang out yep. three of these and then come back in a couple of years. What say you? I mean, also, Timothy Oliphant, is, he, he stayed in the pool. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's just like in between Olympics. Yeah. It's like Michael he Phelps. Never, he might never not took be, the hat off. Yeah. It, it might not be, you know, the Olympic regulation pool, but he's, he's, he's stayed wet. He's been ready playing marshals in different galaxies. I am really excited about this. And, and not just because of the opportunity to see that character and that actor in that character again with the same creative cast. It's what you said. Like, there are a few things in life that bring such consistent pleasure as Elmore Leonard books. And I hope people, this is a good time as any to, to maybe we'll throw some up on some social media platform that you're not allowed to mention on Twitter anymore, as far as I can understand. But like, it is one of life's great pleasures, particularly if you have some time on around the holidays, if you're traveling with your family, just grab, grab a dog-eared paperback. They're all good. Mm-hmm. And they're all good in the, the best way. But to your point, like, yes, why can't we do this? Elmore Leonard created Raylan Givens, Justified sort of scooped him out of the books that he had been in, which are both also really good. I think, is it Pronto and Riding the Rap? Mm -hmm. The the Raylan And then he's in Fire Down the Hole. Um, And then there's a Raylan standalone mm -hmm. book that came later, I think. But why not bring out some of the great underserved Elmore Leonard books, particularly the Detroit ones, which are some of my favorites, and just put this character in it? We, we used to make things in this country. We can do this. Yeah. You know, I'm thrilled about that. And why, so, not, why not take fucking Jodie Foster and have her investigating the disappearance of researchers in an Arctic station? Well, that's the other thing. So it's like, <laughs> the, uh, we often talk about how 
the the box that you deliver the content in matters. And I do think that we have generally are too staid about what is this show and what isn't this show and what it means. And take the franchise. You know what I mean? Like, and I say this with no disrespect to Nick Pizzolatto, but like people, True Detective does mean something to people and audiences and HBO. And if this is the combination that makes sense both to revive or iterate the franchise without him and also tell a story that these interesting creators wanted to tell with Jodie Foster in a leading role in television, like we all win, right? Yeah. Like I don't think yeah. it's, it, the, both of these things, I'm glad you grouped them together because sometimes it's not complicated. I'm not saying, we're not saying both of these shows are going to be slam dunk home runs on our list at the end of the year, but like this is the kind of, this isn't this isn't radical outside the box thinking for TV. It's just good decision making with good creative people, and let's let's take a shot at it. All I right, like let's that. let's move on to the blockbusters. I don't know if this is just words that were on a website, and I'm repeating them, and this is how misinformation happens. But I'm going to tell you something that's the title of a show, the platform it's on, the people involved with it, and we'll just take it from there. Okay. Yes. Did you know there's a show coming on Apple called Godzilla and the Titans, and it stars Kiersey Clemens, Wyatt, and Kurt Russell, and is set in San Francisco after Godzilla versus King Kong destroys the city, and it's developed by Matt Fraction? I'm going to need a second. That's a <laughs> lot of words. Did you know that, though? I knew none of it. I knew none it, of it. I, it seems like it's a conspiracy thriller set in a destroyed San Francisco from one of your and my favorite comic book writers, starring Wyatt and Kurt Russell and Kiersey Clemens. I just don't even know what to do with this information. Like, is this... Sometimes I just feel like... <laughs> like, if you get a meeting... Not, first of all, this is a great idea. I'm learning about it now. I'm excited. But sometimes I do feel like if you get a meeting at one of these places that has money, like, on a summer Friday, you can just walk out with, like, literally, like, the kind of bags of cash they had in Uncle Scrooge comics with the dollar signs on them, and nobody's going to stop you. How could that be real? When's that coming out? I don't know. Uh, it's supposed to come out this year. Just real quick, why is this on Apple and not on, is this not a Warner Brothers thing? Thank you for asking me this, Chris. This is something that I'm passionate about and I've definitely known about. We are very honest about how we make this podcast. We never pause to research or Google. I haven't done it once in, in It's all 10 years. off the dome, which is why it is an honor and a pleasure to tell you my longstanding information that Toho, the owner of the Godzilla character, long ago licensed the rights to Legendary, the mm -hmm. independent sort of studio that does a lot of big franchise films and then legendary controls the rights and licenses it licenses them out or makes the project and sells them so this is legendary for apple okay i think some previous things you know like legendary wanted to do a monster verse but i think warner brothers distributed some of those recent films but it, it's okay I, also that's the other thing i can see on your face this is just classic. I'm just wondering if this is another swing and a miss by Zaz. This wonder, is another Zaz concern trolling. I could see yeah. you're worried about him. You're worried uh, that he doesn't have the, the, the firm hand on the rudder that a company like that needs. He doesn't and, have his firm hand on Godzilla's tail, and now it's wiggled away to Tim Cook. Wow. I have nothing more to add. Uh, in the blockbuster category, and I'm sure there are others here that I'm missing, but here are the ones that I think are of note. Last of Us, which is coming in January, and we'll be spending a lot of time talking about. I'm sure that's Pedro Pascal and... Bella Ramsey in the uh, show based on the post-apocalyptic video game. Dune Sisterhood, HBO Max. I, I wonder if that might not come out in 2023, but who knows? I, I think uh, that would be a lift. And if it did, it would be end, end, end of the year. Also, yeah, because Dune, Dune 2 is coming out in the theaters, I would imagine, at the end of next year. So uh, we also got Skeleton Crew, which is the John Watts Star Wars show with Jude Law, which is said to be in the vein of the Goonies, although I, I would have no idea. And one thing I'm definitely keeping an eye on, although it will have plenty of baggage attached to it, is Masters of the Air. That's the, basically, it's Band of Brothers in the Air uh, from World War II, and it stars Austin Butler and Barry Keegan, but is directed in part by Carrie Fukunaga, although also Tim Van Patten and Dee Reese. So I'm very excited for that. That's on Apple. The jam I wanted to chat with you also about, though, of these, and I, I, love, to, I love to throw you a curveball every once in a while. I love to get the, the, the Vaseline out and throw a junk ball at you. Do you know what I'm kind of excited for? Can I inspect your cap? This is, can we do that? Yeah. It's got a little resin. Do you know what I'm excited for? What? Secret Invasion. You're ex oh, this is your Zag? You're into yeah. this? Yeah. Tell, Olivia tell Coleman me your version. Sam, Sam Jackson and Ben Mendelsohn, I think, are in an espionage show. With Amelia Clark as well. Tell, tell me your version of this. Because usually the way this podcast works is you're like, 
Andy, what are scrolls? I and just I wonder whether or and, not, yeah. like, there's, there's a lot of, like, just, like, very, very, very solid actors in this show. And Kyle Bradstreet, who worked for a while on Mr. Robot, created you know, it, and, Kyle, ran it yeah. and he's adapted off of the Bendis version of Secret Invasion. And I think <laughs> for, during... For, for what it's worth, Chris, last week with Sam, we were joking about how, if, if anyone made it to hour three of that podcast, we were joking about how my first job out here with Sam was on Metropolis and how all the Mr. Robot writers were like, oh, keeping bankers hours, right. are we? Was Kyle and one of quote, them? quote, hyphen Kyle Bradstreet. Right. He was the only one who said that. Well, that, so. all those hours paid off because he's, yeah, exactly. he's fucking running the secret invasion. And while I find like, oop, I've taken my mask off and it turns out I'm an alien is, is not like my favorite plot trope. Was that your Ben Mendelsohn invitation? <laughs> <laughs> not good. Not one of your best. No, it was kind of like Mr. Movie Phone. <laughs> It was. <laughs> Press two if you'd like me to invade your secrets. <laughs> Do you think it's about people who invade secrets? No wonder you're hyped for this movie. <laughs> it's a TV show. Sense. Are you excited for it? <laughs> it's a t- I don't know what it is. I'm really interested in it because in giving some thought to why, in my opinion, a lot of Marvel MCU TV stuff has not worked versus how it could work. Um, one thing that I did realize is that the, the the reliance of TV to sort of, of the, some of these TV shows to kind of fall into the same trap as the worst parts of the movies, which is the sort of like by the numbers origin story. And so by the time the first series is over, yeah. you've gotten yeah, to the yeah. point where characters are interesting, except now it's been eight hours instead of the first 40 minutes. I would much rather the TV shows do the bananas crossover shit from the comics that you can't do in movies. Now you can do it in movies. That's what the MCU experiment was, but that was one of the, that's for the, hopefully is reserved for the biggest, largest ones with, you know, Infinity Stones or coming up with Kang stuff, Secret Wars, all that. But there's so many of these. I mean, every year Marvel has some of these, these uh, crossovers that in, especially in recent years, not just with Bendis' stuff, but people like Jonathan Hickman and Jason Aaron, like really, really cool galaxy brain comic writers that would be fun to do it on TV with pre-existing characters. And frankly, I would be super into it. Like if you told me that there was a Marvel TV show coming to the Disney Plus service that told the crazy crossover story of Thunderbolts, I don't know what that crossover story would be, and you named the cast of the upcoming movie Thunderbolts, I would be like, sick. That yeah. sounds great. That sounds yeah. like a really fun six to eight weeks of my life watching the show. Every time you tell me it's a movie, I'm like, you were serious about that? Like I don't, it doesn't track. So I, I like, first of all, I love it when you celebrate aliens invading your secrets, but I think it's a good point. I think it's worth circling this one because it might be trying to do something different. Okay, so that's blockbusters. And out of Dune Sisterhood, Last of Us, Skeleton Crew, Masters of the Air was another one you had your eye on there? Of the ones that you named or the ones yeah. on my private list that I had on my... Pri- uh, on your private... I, I, your I have my own private. polling services. I've, I've been having my operatives out in the field. Um, no, I, I think that you're right. I, I'm, I think the, the biggest question mark for me is Last of Us because it, on paper, it's a lot of, a lot of uh, looking a little bit askance emoji. Like it's, okay. you know, based on a video game, it's zombie stuff again, but it's HBO, but it's Craig Mazin, right? It's like, it's Pablo, pa- it, it, Pedro Pascal. It's like Bella Ramsey. It, there's, there's so many good, a lot of other good actors in it too that I'm forgetting, blanking on right now, but like, Olivia Colden and Sam Jackson. Murray Bartlett is yeah. in it. Um, you're, just, you're so it. This is, this is I, I just, you being in on Secret Invasion is great. The, this is my The Hanukkah lion from 1923 today. is also in Last of Us. <laughs> R.I.P. He was the last of him. It's actually what it's about. No, just to say, like, I'm really curious about how they class this up. Not that the, I mean, the video game was like rave, it got rave reviews. People think of it as an incredible, almost work of art. I respect that. I'm just curious how they elevated this because on paper it doesn't seem appealing, but everything about the execution might make it that way. Might make it succeed. Now I have a section called prestige and Mm -hmm. I'm really fired up for all four of these. So I'm going to just run through them. Then you tell me which one you're most excited about the sympathizer on HBO, which is based on the best-selling and critically acclaimed novel. It's directed by Park Chan-wook and it features Robert Downey Jr. in multiple roles following a half French, half Vietnamese spy at the end of the Vietnam war. And then afterwards, Yep. Fuck yes. In. 
Mrs. Davis, Damon Lindelof and Tara Hernandez's show about a powerful artificial intelligence and the nun dedicated to destroying it. Betty Gilpin is the nun. Can't wait. That's on Peacock. Daisy Jones and the Six, that's on Amazon, and that is definitely on March. I think it's March 3rd. It looks like an almost famous style show based on the best-selling novel starring Riley Keough, Sam Claflin, and Suki Waterhouse. And I, I think Oliphant's in this. And Michael Weber and Scott Neustadter, who did 500 Days of Summer, wrote it, and it looks fucking awesome. Oliphant's the, the, the marshal that busts them for having marijuana on the tour bus? That's right. I, don't, I think they have a little bit more than marijuana in this 1970s rock band, which is what this is about. And then finally, my guy, Stevie Sodes, open up a can of whoop ass on us. <laughs> The show is called Full Circle. It centers on an investigation into a botched kidnapping that uncovers long-held secrets connecting multiple characters and cultures in present-day New York. That is from the playlist description. It's an all-star cast. Zazie Beats, Claire Danes, Oliphant again and again, and Dennis Quaid. And Soderbergh directs all the episodes and Ed Solomon wrote it. You know, I'm really glad you suggested doing this bit because I feel a lot better about TV next year. I, I was, as someone who works in it, I'm real scared. As someone who gets to watch it and talk about it with you, we're in good shape. We are. These as four long shows. As, as long as it's not all these shows get dropped March 13th to qualify for Emmys. Great point. Great point. But the, the, this this all sounds exciting. And these all sound like the princes we were promised when there was the, going to be this the, new era the sympathizer of is a real thing, if that's really happening, like, I can't believe it. If Downey is going to go for it again, I know, I know he's an Oppenheimer. I know he's getting serious. But if that, if that man decides to act again, I just can't wait. Well, it's interesting, too, because he, I mean, this is a Team Downey production. And he and his wife, Susan, they're like, this isn't it's not a vanity shingle. Like they make things and they, they are very hands-on and they, and she's a it's very, very, very wire season two over there. You know? Producer. <laughs> so they can do this. Right. Yeah. And it takes being Iron Man to get Park Chan Wook directing this adaptation. I mean, like great. Then you have used your power as well. So that's exciting. I, I, I mean, it's been a minute since Damon had a show. Right. Yeah. Excited for new Damon. Okay. So then I have the last few ser- se- ones here. I have thrillers. And then I have fun. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, like, thr- I like both of those things. Number one for the thriller category that I'm just losing my mind over is Class of 09, which is on FX and stars Kate Mara and Brian Tyree Henry as FBI agents reunited after a friend's death. And it's written by Tom Rob Smith. I'm just <laughs> learning about this. This is real? <laughs> yes. Wow. T- tell tell people who Tom Rob Smith is. He wrote London Spy. He did the Gianni Versace American Crime Story. He's a wonderful writer, and I can't wait to see Brian Tiger Henry take on something that he has written. Sam Esmail is going to hate this show. Why? Because Brian Tyree Henry will be in most of the episodes. Oh, that's not right. All of them. That's right. He hates. He hates that. <sighs> did you know that coming soon on the Netflix channel hmm. is a show called Kaleidoscope? From okay. Jose Padilla, who directed Elite Squad, which is like this series of Brazilian action movies. It stars Giancarlo Esposito. It's a heist show. And the entire premise is that it's the heist told from all these different categories. The sh- episodes are named after colors, and it doesn't matter what order you watch the episodes in. Great. I can't see this being something that you make a project for yourself, but I thought I'd mention it in passing. I love it. I also, you know, guys... Te- Ted and Reed never stop innovating. This is what I was going to say. Last week, you know, Zaz, Reed, Ted, Bella, like they, they, they were in for some lumps from us. You know what I mean? And, and maybe some of them were fair. Maybe we hit a little hard. Maybe we should have pulled some punches. I don't know. But you, it is worth noting that the vast majority of people who work on stuff, whether they're in the suites and the offices or whatever, you know, they're, they're in independent pods or production studios, like everybody's trying. And everybody, I think, at every streamer and service has one of these. Now, maybe it's not Giancarlo Esposito starring in a uh, thriller that you can watch in any order you want, but everybody probably has their thing. You know what I mean? That that matters to them. Yeah, it's what's how in, things what's like in the, the Bandersnatch box, basically, right? It's exactly. So thank you for your service, people who have really put their necks on the line for these projects and may then lose their jobs because of them. We thank you. Keep fighting the good fight. Uh, a couple more thrillers all of which sound great. I don't know if um, 
I don't know if this is ever going to come out. I've been waiting for it. I, I, I hope it does. This is one that I'm worried is going to get caught in like streaming war stuff is Steve Zalian's adaptation of Ripley, the Patricia Highsmith books. I, I mean, starring that's Andrew filmed. Scott. Okay. What, give, give it to me. I don't know what the story of it is. I know that they were filming in Italy and it's for Showtime. I know they made a lot of pretty bold aesthetic choices. This is all this is all I know about it. And I've not seen it dated. I've not seen any footage. Are we overrepresenting Italy on prestige television right now? Clearly not. You know? <laughs> I mean, first of all, they canceled Tucci. So that's true. That's that's one. Tucci's that's one looking big dog for a down. home though. Maybe we should host Tucci on one of our social media channels looking for Italy. Ours for Italy? or the or the ringers? I think if it came from us, it would mean more. It would be like a more sincere endorsement. I'm only on Parlor, so I don't know if you'd be willing to do that. <laughs> Other thrillers that I'm looking forward to. I don't know if this is going to be considered a thriller, but it falls sort of in this zone, which is uh, Bad Monkey on Apple, which is Vince Vaughn in oh, yeah. the Carl Hyacin adaptation from Bill Lawrence. Carl this is Hyacin real. is a beloved, um, I would say, light crime novelist like comic yeah. crime novelist, like usually very uh, like rogues gallery of characters in Southern Florida trying to get one over on each other. Not unlike Elmore Leonard, but perhaps a little bit less noirish and more more like fully comedy. Uh, it seems like very ripe for Vince Vaughn's interpretation and I can't wait to see it. Bag Monkey is also a very, very funny and good book. Here's one that I am like, where the fuck is this? Put it in my face is Get Millie Black. For years now, we have been waiting for a Marlon James adaptation, whether it's Brief History of Seven Killings or his fantasy series, Black Leopard, Red Wolf. This is from him directly. It's not a novel. It's one he wrote, and it is about uh, a Jamaican-born UK detective who goes to Kingston to join the police and crosses paths with a Scottish detective. Yeah, get me that. <laughs> yeah. Did they make that? Is that happening? That's what it says. That's I'm just reading what I see. This is my research, you know? Marlon James, come on the watch. Um, a couple other things. The Night Agent. I just love the setup for this. This is a Netflix show from Sean Ryan, and it's about an FBI agent who is told to sit in a room and watch a phone that never rings until ellipsis. And then it also features... It rings. What happens? It features Hong Whoa. Chow. <laughs> Don't spoil it. And then we get to the fun stuff. A couple okay. of fun things. How about Poker Face? Let's not, I was hoping let's not be too cute. cute. The Ryan I, I was going to bring this up. Then when you said that one of the categories was you know fun, what? I was like, he's got it. Andy, you've got the conch. You tell me all about it. Oh, this is uh, Ryan Johnson, uh, Knives Out, Last Jedi, etc. Um, walked in to the Peacock channel with Natasha Leone and was like, you know what was good? TV shows like Columbo, stuff like that. I want to make one. And they were like, please take all of the money. And then they were like, we're, we're Peacock, just take some of the money. This hopefully this will be this will cover. Um, <laughs> Wait, and, can we have some back back? Actually, <laughs> yeah, no, no. Can I hold just? Can I hold that just till Q four? When I said um, money, what I really meant was, yeah, money is a really fungible term these days. I know we that still have this girls five ever set. We'd love for you guys to use. Netflix took that problem off their hands. I'd like to know more about that deal. Netflix is like, we're good. We'll take that. Yeah, you're right, though. This is an episodic. It's supposed to be made so that you can follow the mystery of the episode and not have to be part of like a, you know, serialized story. I I have read the first episode of this. I'm full disclosure. It's awesome. Um, I have no other connection to the show, but it's really cool. It's what TV used to be, but also maybe a glimpse of what it could be and really leans into it in a way that feels really exciting. It's also a show that is benefiting from Ryan Johnson's very deep Rolodex. I don't know if you've seen, like if you if you go on like Deadline or a, a Hollywood Trade and just search the show Poker Face, you will see a wild collection of people who are appearing on it. Because yeah. again, it is not, and there's, there's serialized elements, but it is procedural in the sense of episode to episode mysteries in different locations. And so people can show up and just do something fun. But a lot of great cast. I, I'm really excited about this. And it feels like the kind of thing that if it hits, it could be significant. But the caveat on that is what does it mean to hit in 2023 and what does it mean to hit on Peacock? I don't know. I don't know. Can you replicate it? Because Ryan Johnson kind of seems like a one of one, right? In terms of his relationship to the industry at this moment. So I don't know, but I think that, that I was, I was hoping you were going to flag that. I'm very excited about that show. That's coming shortly. Uh, and then another fun thing that I spotted that I thought would be cool is platonic from Apple, which is Nick Stoller's rom-com starring Rose Byrne and Seth Rogen. Rumored to be in the vein of when Harry met Sally. 
I mean, that's a great cast. Not since Neighbors. Not Those since Neighbors have we seen such an amazing depiction such, such, of such, Ro- Rose Byrne and Seth Rogen of, of Rogen and Rose. I mean, <laughs> that movie's uh, pretty funny. I love it. I love it. Chris, you've really done me a service here. I got, guess what I love? Service Television. journalism. Okay, Kaya. Oh, uh-huh, that too. Kaya, do we were going to say? Yes, yes, what's up? First of all, happy holidays. Although Thanks I guess so people much. will listen to this at any given time. If you were to choose one show that I just named in the most anticipated shows of 2023 list that you were most anticipating, can you think of one? Yes, definitely the Kaleidoscope one. Um, I've always wanted to innovate. Hell the way yeah, I bro. <laughs> That's right. Kaya. Web Kaya 2. Point is Kaya. Next level. <laughs> okay. We wrap so, this and we go on to me the, doing that next year. That's right. Kaya watching all types of orders of episodes. What's exciting is that we continue to record this podcast. I mean, you could just stop the sentence there. That is incredible that we continue to do this. But we continue to record this podcast as if it is a serialized story. So I make reference to a throwaway joke I used to defend Sam Esmail's attacks in hour two of our podcast two weeks ago. And I say it as if it's canonical. You know, so people listening will be like, oh, we understand why Andy suggested that Sam Esmail personally dislikes one of the greatest actors of our time, Brian Tyree Henry. He doesn't. <laughs> he just, Sam just doesn't like shows where the main cast is in every episode. Yeah. So I think he'd really like Kaleidoscope. Sam and Kaya are the thought leaders of the Watch Expanded Universe. We're, There's we're, never been We're any the doubt. old guard. We're the 1873 to their 1923. <laughs> I love it. Let's stick with this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to change it. I'm calling it 1873. All right. You're we're going to wrap Dutton. up here. You never apologize. Uh, this episode's going out Monday the 19th. I hope everybody has a safe and happy holidays. We'll have a mailbag episode that goes up on the 29th that we're recording right now. Thank you so much as always for listening to The Watch. It's been another wonderful year with these two people and we can't wait for 23. Yeah, we love you guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Kaya. Happy holidays, Branskis. 